young man was in a terrible auto accident and Tina was his mother. They brought him home from the hospital. I mean, he was really, really in terrible shape and she would not leave him. She wouldn't come to church. She wouldn't go anywhere. She stayed there right with him until he was much better. How long did you do that? Stay right, right there. A couple weeks, but she wasn't leaving. That's what mothers do. They don't give up. Your baby's dead. There's no chance. She wasn't accepting that. Proverbs 31, 20, I had read it before. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. And Proverbs 31, 31, honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring, bring her praise at the city gate. One early morning, the lady went in to wake up her son. Wake up, son. It's time to go to school. And the son says, but why, Mom? I don't want to go. And she said, give me two reasons why you don't want to go. Well, the kids hate me, for one, and the teachers hate me, too. And the mother said, well, that's no reason not to go to school. Come on now and get ready. And the son said, give me two reasons why I should go to school. And she says, well, for one, you're 52 years old, and for another, you're the principal. <laughs> the kids hate me, and so do the teachers. You're the principal. Get up and get ready for school. A mother would never say certain things. Mother wouldn't say, how can you see TV sitting so far back? Mother wouldn't say, yeah, I used to skip school a lot too. <laughs> mother wouldn't say that. Mother wouldn't say, just leave all the lights on. Makes the house look more cheery. Mother wouldn't say, let me smell that shirt. Yeah, it's good for another week. Mother wouldn't say that. Mother wouldn't say, go ahead and keep that stray dog, honey. I'll be glad to feed it and walk it every day. <laughs> A mother wouldn't say, well, if Billy's mama says it's okay, it's good enough for me. A mother wouldn't say, you don't have to eat those nasty veggies. Have some more dessert. <laughs> Mother wouldn't say that. I don't have a tissue with me. Just use your sleeve. Mother wouldn't say that. I used to, I used to do that to when I was about five or six. I can remember that. Mother wouldn't say, don't bother wearing a jacket. The wind chill is bound to improve. <laughs> so Mother's Dictionary of Meanings. A dumbwaiter, one who asks if the kids would care to order dessert. Feedback, the inevitable result when the baby doesn't appreciate the strained carrots. Full name, what you call your child when you're mad at him. Grandparents, the people who think your children are wonderful, even though you're sure you're not raising them, even though they're sure you're not raising them right. Hearsay, what toddlers do when anyone mutters a dirty word. Puddle, a small body of water that draws other small bodies wearing dry shoes into it. Show off. A child who's more talented than yours. <laughs> Top bunk. Well, you should never put a child wearing Superman jammies. <laughs> Two minute warning. When the baby's face turns red and she begins to make those familiar grunting noises. <laughs> Who done it? None of the kids that live in your house. <laughs> Mother's a physical extension of God's love. A mother's touch, as we saw in those two videos. It's God's hand extended. It comes from God's heart through a mother's heart through her hands and what she does. 
without the touch that babies crave, they cannot grow up normal. Did you know that? If babies aren't stroked and touched, they can't be normal. Babies always want to be held. Mother's touch is a comfort that nothing else can equal. Mother is number two, an emotional extension of God's love. A mother's love is so powerful that there is nothing she won't do, including kill or be killed for the safety and well-being of her child. Number three, a mother is a caregiver. A mother sets the standard for the care of her children. She sets the standard for what her children eat, what they wear, what they learn, and the safety of their surroundings. Number four, mother's a lawgiver. Mother's the first one to say, no, don't touch that. The do's and don'ts of a small child's life come from mother. Why is that? Because daddy isn't there. He's out making a living to buy the to buy the next bottle of milk, to buy the pampers. She's the one that's there. She's the enforcer, number five. Because I'm the mom, that's why. <laughs> There's no worse trouble you can get in than trouble with mom. Because it carries some emotional burdens that you, you know, it would be better if you get in trouble with the judge than trouble with your mother. Mothers are also first aid experts. Kiss it and make it better. They're expert band-aid appliers because they get a lot of practice at that. At least in my rough and tumble youth, <laughs> they did. Mother's an educator. It's at mother's knee or in her lap that a child first hears about Jesus. The counsel of a biblical mother. Proverbs 31, I read parts of this before. The sayings of Kim, King Lemuel. An inspired utterance his mother taught him. Some scholars think that Lemuel was actually Solomon. Some think he was Hezekiah. That name means for God or devoted to God. If he was Solomon, then his mother was Bathsheba. Whoever she was, this mother's counsel follows. Listen, my son. Listen, son of my womb. Listen, my son. The answer to my prayers. See, if this is Solomon, if Lemuel is Solomon, his brother, the son of the uh, indiscretion of King David and Bathsheba, died, as you know. She probably prayed in her grief and her guilt, and the son, Solomon, was the answer to her prayers. Number three, or verse three, do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. So she's advising righteousness, she's advising wholesome living, one wife, etc. If Lemuel was Solomon, he certainly failed to take her advice because he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. 700 wives! He wouldn't even remember their names. Think, uh, think what it would take to make 700 tuna fish sandwiches for all them. If this is Bathsheba, she's advising a standard of behavior based on her own experience, her own grief, and her own guilt. She was almost one who ruined a king, David, herself. Verse 4, it's, it is not for kings, Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for rulers to crave beer. Verse 5, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Verse 6, let beer be for those who are perishing, wine for those who are in anguish. Verse 7, let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Here she is warning her son, the king, not to allow the effects of alcohol to cause him to rule 
oppressively. This mother's wisdom is counsel with a clear mind. Only with a clear mind that is unclouded by alcohol can you hear from God. Verse 8, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Number nine, verse number 9, speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. So no matter who this mother is, the mother of the king, she is advising fairness and concern for the poor and for the needy. Jesus was always concerned about the poor and the needy. The first nine verses were written to reflect the sentiments of Lemuel's mother. And if he was actually Solomon, then this was Bathsheba's sentiments. But they really don't know. The king was acutely aware of her counsel, of her principles. Obviously, he had learned from her. She was his teacher, and she inspired him to noble principles. Whether or not he adhered to these principles, we don't know. If it was Solomon, then he didn't follow his mother's advice. The rest of the psalm is a complimentary description of a noble woman. The noble woman is a mother. Lemuel admires his wife and mother and describes the features of her character that the king finds admirable. So we pick it up in verse 10. A wife of noble character, who can find? She's worth far more than rubies because of her noble character. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks, and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. The things that she does, we're down to verse 13, she selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She's like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for the task. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds a distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate when he takes his seat among the elders in the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. So verse 25 to 31 describes her very core, her character. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her husband and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And verse 31, honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. So verse 30 where it said, a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. All of the counsel of Lemuel's mother and her strength to manage her household and the beauty of her character comes from her fear of the Lord. She's to be praised because she honored God in all that she does. 
in her days being born again in that time wasn't available Jesus has Jesus hadn't come yet the penalty hadn't been paid yet the day would come meanwhile the fear of the Lord would bring God's favor and guide the godly believing person to live a life pleasing to God Proverbs chapter 9 and 10 the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding qualities of a Christian mother this is from a website called the covenant relationships the author is Crystal McDowell quality number one she possesses a keen sense of discernment a discerning heart seeks knowledge that's Proverbs 15 14 a good Christian mother stays immediately connected with God so that she will keep a discerning heart she's willing to grow in knowledge through the reading of God's Word and absorb uh, absorbing truth from mature godly mothers God grants her discernment in the lives of her children so that they may be specifically well trained in righteousness Qual quality quality number two she persists in prayer at all times it's uh, in Luke 18 one says they should always pray and not give up a believing mom never gives up on her children especially the prodigals the ones who have taken an errant path believing mothers never give up on them for years and years they pray people will write off a difficult rebellious child but not a praying mother she's not going to write him off she's not going to give up she will plead the grace and mercy of God over their lives as long as there's breath in her body this mother is compelled and encouraged by the Holy Spirit to keep praying no matter what quality number three she demonstrates unconditional love there is no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear John 4 18 no matter who loves God with all not no matter <clears throat> a mother who loves God with all her heart isn't afraid to unconditionally love her children even if they're bad like I was <laughs> most of the time <laughs> she recognizes that her patience will be tried by disobedience but it will never cause her love to regress in anger her love spurs confidence in her offspring since they never worry about loss of love due to bad behavior there's plenty of bad behavior to go around the Bible says that there's none good we're all sinners we're all sinners quality number four she cultivates a joyful environment in your presence is fullness of joy Psalm 1611 those who enter into the home of a godly mother sense the presence of joy her deeply rooted joy sustains her through the difficulties of living in an ungodly world I don't think the world has ever been as ungodly as it is right now she has mastered the ability to encourage her children toward joy in every situation who else could do that but a mother who else could do that quality number five she exhibits a steadfastness in the Word of God all who follow his precepts have good understanding Psalm 111 verse 10 she meditates on the Holy Scriptures regularly the Christian mother actively engages the Word of God for every problem in her home she meditates on the Holy Scriptures regularly as well as speaking and teaching them to her children her family witnesses her diligence and learns from her example to apply God's teachings to their everyday lives quality number six forgiveness forgives the offenses of others willingly 
If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. First John 20, uh, John 20 and 23. Offenses will come from within and outside of her home. Yet the godly mother won't hold forgiveness hostage until she feels better. She doesn't do that. Rather, she chooses to forgive immediately and trust the Holy Spirit to heal her hurts. Her family recognizes this principle in her and practices forgiving others as a way of life. Quality number seven, she embraces a spirit of contentment. But godliness without contentment, with contentment is great gain, 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. A godly mother resists the urge to be discontented with her surroundings, her children, her husband. She recognizes that the chasing of worldliness and riches will never bring her peace. Instead, she trusts in the Lord to provide all her needs and grant her desires according to His will. Quality number eight, she trusts in God. Those who know your name trust you for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you, Psalm 910. Her trust in God is most evident during the difficult seasons of her life. The Christian mother is tempted, like other believers, to doubt the Lord and hand her and hand over her life. Yet she remains steadfast in his ability to take care of her and her family's needs. She establishes a trust relationship with God that grows every day. Quality number nine, she keeps the faith. A faithful person will be richly blessed, Proverbs 28, 20. Her faith will most certainly be tested in her roles of wife and mother. A godly mother will accept the trying of her faith so she can grow in perseverance. She demonstrates her faithfulness as she continues to mature in her relationship with God and with others. Quality number 10, she brings order to chaos. Think about that one. I know when I was a kid, there was plenty of chaos in the house with my brother and sister and I. Plenty of chaos. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness, Proverbs 31, 27. The Christian mother is marked for her diligence and resistance to laziness and slothfulness. Her chief concern isn't the perfect home, but rather a healthy home full of love, laughter, and order. She keeps her home free not only from physical clutter, but watches for the spiritual and emotional clutter of worldliness. Quality number 11, she holds to what is right. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, Matthew 13, 43. As a godly mother, she makes the tough decisions that run against the torrent of societal corruption of children and youth. She sticks to what is right in the eyes of God for her children's spiritual, emotional, and physical well-being. A Christian mother expects resistance and refuses to, com to comprise uh, righteousness for acceptance. Quality number 12, and this is the last one. Willing to release her children to God. Hope does not disappoint, Romans 5, 5. While the Christian mother holds her children tightly around her heart, she releases them to grow in Christ at their own pace. She's entrusted her prayers to God to protect and lead them in the direction of His will. Her influence and persuasion centers around the Lord's will more than her personal preference for their future. Mothers are precious. I don't have my amen button, but the batteries wore out here. But. <laughs> There's no substitute for the love of a mother. To a small child, no other lap is as comforting. Mothers put themselves in the back seat 
They put the interest and well-being of their children ahead of their own interest and well-being. They sacrifice for their children. They take care of the child before they take care of themselves. Today we honor our Christian godly mothers. The ones in the house, the ones that we think of, that we have with us, and the ones who have gone before us, we honor our Christian godly mothers. We need to honor them always. Sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. We're little kids. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I did. Maybe not. But in my adult years, I certainly did. I want all the mothers to come down here and I want to close the service just by everybody gathering around. Come on, mothers, get up. And come on down and just stand up close here. And I'm going to ask everybody else to stand behind them. And then after we conclude this prayer, I think there's... I think there's enough of these for everybody to take two. I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I have 16 of them. So you could do that. You could take two. All right. Everybody else, come on, get, a, get around behind these moms here. Come up so they can get behind you. Don't worry. You won't get any on you. <laughs> come on, gather.